Okay, so we're back with some more questions with Mike Peck from Activate. Um, our next question is, what is the first sign of heart disease and what do you think is the biggest culprit as far as inactivity or poor diet or hereditary? What do you think causes heart disease? Well, I think the scariest thing about heart disease is um, most often you have no idea that you have issues uh, of plaque building up in your carotid arteries and, and beginning to have poor circulation to the heart. You don't always have uh, chest pain with activity before you have maybe your first heart attack. Um, so number one is you may not always have a warning sign and, and go and see your doctor. So that gets back into participating in wellness exams or doing some kind of regular follow-up, certainly by the time you're 40 and, and earlier than that, getting your cholesterol levels checked. So we know if you have high cholesterol and a strong family history, we take some actions up front instead of waiting until you have chest pain and need a cath and a stent or you've had your first heart attack. Um, outside of that, then if you have uh, plaque buildup in your artery and you're going to begin to have some symptoms with activity uh, because you're not getting enough blood flow to the heart muscle, those symptoms are shortness of breath, um, with less activity than you think it should cause or shortness of breath that doesn't respond with rest as quickly as it should. Uh, chest discomfort anywhere in the chest, kind of pain between the chin and the belly button. When we're hearing someone talk about pain in that area, one of the things we should be thinking about is could this be related to the heart and poor circulation to the heart muscle or plaque in the arteries. Um, pain that is reproducible with, act with activity. If you walk at a certain pace and you're fine, but if you go faster, you can kind of walk into this chest heaviness and shortness of breath. And if you slow down and sit, it goes away. But every time you try and go faster, it seems to come back. That should be very concerning. Um, any type of chest discomfort associated with shortness of breath, the pain radiates into the neck, arm, shoulders, um, or into the back, and it's accompanied with sweating and upset stomach or nausea, that's an ER visit. Um, and the problem with chest discomfort is because of our uh, habit of eating larger serving sizes, eating too many fatty, spicy foods, and having big problems uh, with reflux disease or heartburn, is that a lot of people confuse or write off chest discomfort as heartburn and don't seek um, attention or don't get worked up early enough. And then when the heartburn doesn't go away or now, you know, they're having this elephant sitting on their chest, now they're having a heart attack when three, four, five, six months ago, it could have been plaque and a cardiac cath with a stent or some type of procedure could have prevented that first heart attack. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be really suspicious. If you're having pain you haven't had before, if the pain doesn't go away with a couple antacids, and if it's the worst heartburn you've ever had or you're just not sure, you need seen. Okay. And what do you think is the biggest culprit? Biggest culprit is going to get back to what we've been beating up on in our previous videos, sedentary lifestyle, uh, unhealthy diet, too much saturated fat, uh, and, and lack of activity. So a lot of this goes back to that same theme, healthy diet, regular exercise, and, and stuff in moderation. Okay. Okay, so let's step away from the heart a little bit. and. Talk about diabetes. Um, what do you think the biggest risk factor is for type 2 diabetes? I think if anybody would take the time and Google that on WebMD or read about that, it's going to be obesity or being overweight, having a body mass index greater than 30, and a sedentary lifestyle. Uh, and what often gets us there is eating too big a servings of your carbohydrates and your starches, too much bread, pasta, cereals, potatoes, corn, rice, too much of everything and, and no activity. Mm -hmm. And we, we always say we're gonna do something about it and one year becomes five years, becomes 15 years, and then we're coming in because we're losing weight, we're thirsty all the time, we're tired after a meal, um, and we're peeing all the time, and now we've got sugars in the three and 400 range and we've been diabetic for five to seven years and we didn't even know it. And the damage has... Part of, the, yeah, part of that is irreversible. Yeah. Okay, so is there a symptom we should look for? Um, you know, it, it, what would a symptom be if I was experiencing diabetic, if, if I was pre-diabetic, say? Would there be a symptom that I would experience? Pre, a warning? Yeah, pre-diabetes is having a fasting blood sugar of 100 to 125 
being diabetic is having two fasting blood sugars more than 126. So those are number terms where we put you in the pre-diabetic or impaired fasting glucose diagnosis versus the diagnosis of diabetes. So can I talk? So a blood sugar of 125, would I be feeling a little different? Probably not. No, okay. No symptoms. Now, the issue with diabetes, what we find, other than persons who are coming in now and getting their wellness physicals done, healthy younger persons who don't really perceive they have problems, um, when we do some screening labs, we're finding persons that have that impaired fasting glucose blood sugar, and you typically have no idea that you're beginning to have problems with your sugars. That pre-diabetic 100 to 125, there are typically no symptoms associated with that. Then when you start having sugars, fasting sugars above 126 and maybe uh, a blood sugar two hours after you eat your typical meal with maybe too many carbohydrates and starches in it and your sugars drift up into the mid 200s, you may not have symptoms other than increased thirst and increased urination. When your sugars go above 250, sugar spills out through the kidneys, it pulls extra water with it and it makes you thirsty and you drink more and you're peeing a lot and you're like, I'm not even drinking that much but I'm peeing all the time. Then you get a little bit dehydrated and if you reach for things that have carbohydrates in them, fruit juices, uh, sugary type drinks of any source, Gatorade or any of that, they're all popped with sugar in them, whether or not they have more or less electrolytes. Then you keep adding sugar to the fire and you keep peeing out this extra sugar and it can end up that your sugars jump into the five, six, seven hundred range and now you have diabetic ketoacidosis and you're in the emergency room. But uh, bottom line is most persons have been diabetic for three to five, if not five to seven years and had no idea they were diabetic other than occasionally they get thirsty and they pee a lot and the symptoms are pretty benign, they're easy to ignore. If you go out and do some physical activity and burn up that extra sugar, your sugars will drop back down below 250 and you don't feel anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just sneaks up on you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think the summary is move more, eat better, and get your preventative screenings done so that we can find these problems out before it's too late. I agree. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>